Oh, sorry. Okay. So uh, today I'm going to talk about your worst nightmare, especially during the pandemic, uh, which is uh, Netflix being down. Um, and pretty much just talk about what we do inside Netflix to kind of avoid that happening, uh, particularly in the observability space, which is kind of what I'm in. So just a bit of background. So um, I used to be the founder CEO of a startup in the monitoring space called Outlier. Uh, some of you may remember it as Data Loop. We kind of changed the name um, a few years um, after we started. Um, and uh, we actually sold that last year. Um, as part of that, we actually co-founded this meetup, which, you're, which is now grown to 12,000 members worldwide. I still kind of own um, the San Francisco chapter of this uh, uh, DevOps exchange. And, um, and actually, this is a picture from our very first meetup in St. Catherine's Docks. But I think we had like 50 people turn up. And uh, I think that's Sam Pointer from Space Ape Games talking about how they did DevOps there. But um, yeah, it's, uh, I'm very proud to see how this has grown and definitely wouldn't have got here without Tony and his team uh, helping uh, to get it here for, uh, with Lens Recruit. Um, so anyway, so after we kind of sold the company last year, I did take uh, a year off almost, um, kind, of, kind of just uh, advising some startups on the side, some VCs and, and kind of you know, getting bored because it's quite boring, not doing anything. Um, so eventually I started looking for a job this year because um, I figured as I'm living in Silicon Valley now, I used to live in London, now I live in San Francisco, um, I sh it would be quite interesting to see what it's like to work in one of these big tech companies and build my network over here before I jump in and do something else. And, um, and along the way, um, Netflix, which were actually a customer of ours um, at Outlier, one of our biggest customers um, before we sold it, um, I already knew the team there. We actually used Atlas DB, their time series database um, behind the scenes for, for building Outlier. Um, they approached me to head up their telemetry team, and um, that's what I do now. So I joined um, Netflix in April, and I now head up the telemetry engineering team, uh, which I'll kind of show you a bunch of stuff we're building um, internally at Netflix. So for those of you that haven't um, got too much background on kind of how Netflix works, um, essentially, Netflix is a global service. You know, it's used by hundreds of millions of users every every uh, every day, and um, it's a very complex service. So, a lot of the things that you know we talk about at DevOps Exchange, like you know DevOps and uh, developers owning their own services, microservices, you know, all these uh, all these kind of things. You know, these all kind of started at companies like Netflix. Netflix was definitely on the cutting edge of a lot of these things. Um, so when you press that play button just to watch, you know, um, Tiger King, as I've got behind me, you know, the interaction there is, is you know, you're basically interacting with tens, maybe up to 100 microservices behind the scenes that have to orchestrate very quickly in the space of a second to basically send you that video back so you can start watching it on your screen. So it's a very complex service. And... Um, um, but despite that, uh, and, and so because it's a complex service, um, one of our kind of biggest fears is um, is Netflix going down. Um, and um, um, what, one of the things people are surprised about is we don't actually have an S any SLAs at Netflix. Like there is no kind of number that you know our teams are trying to hit in terms of uptime and all that kind of stuff as you would expect at some of these uh, large services. Um, really, the mandate for us is just don't make Netflix down a meme. And as you can see, every time we have an outage, you know, usually now because of our size, um, it gets reported in the um, in the news. Um, people start putting memes on Twitter. Um, so we, we're basically all about trying to minimize Netflix down becoming a meme that everyone kind of thinks is funny. And, and I think um, Netflix has done a really good job of that because... Despite um, a global pandemic, one of the things that I did notice, I joined a few weeks after the pandemic kind of uh, kicked off, I've been 100% virtual since I joined, um, is although we're in all of these countries in red, which is pretty much every single country around the world apart from China um, and a couple of others, um, we added about 20 million new subscribers, which was pretty much what Netflix had planned for the entire year in about the space of two or three months. And as far as um, I'm aware, we didn't have any major outages or any scaling issues or anything. And I think that's a testament to just how well uh, the service behind the scenes has been developed and built. Um, but I think the other thing as to how we kind of achieved that is, and one of the reasons actually, in fact, the main reason why I, I joined Netflix is because of the culture. Um, so 
the culture here is very unique. And coming as a founder who's used to having autonomy and kind of building my own company and all this kind of stuff, you know, um, there's not many big companies that, you know, I, I think I'd be excited to join. Um, but when Netflix was a customer of ours, I used to come on site all the time. I, I you know, one of the things I notice is, you know, every company, when you usually go in, you have to sign in and get a badge and all this kind of stuff. Netflix doesn't do that. You just wait in the lobby and the person who's coming to get you just gets you and you just go in. There's there's no signing in and all this kind of stuff. And um, and the reason for that is because they basically lean into people over process. So they only hire senior engineers and senior people. So you're not going to get in here as a graduate. Um, you, 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 you have to have experience to kind of get into, into Netflix. Um, but because of that, there's a level of maturity, a level of kind of excellence and experience that all the team members have. And in, in, even in my team, you know, uh, my, my team members on average have over 10 years experience building these highly scalable distributed systems. People know what they're doing. So when there is like a pandemic, for example, um, back in March, um, I think there was literally a two week scramble where the company basically had to move fully remote and we had to move all our animation studios and, and uh, post production into the cloud and, and allow um, kind of editors and animators to kind of work virtually from home. Um, you know, that, that, that kind of all happened in about two weeks. And after that, back to business as usual, like even though everything was disrupted and everyone had to move from home, there wasn't really any major fires behind the scenes. And I, can, I, I saw that when I came in. It's a very well-run company because of the culture. Um, and there's this book on the side, if, if you are interested in learning more about the Netflix culture, um, it's just been post, um, published by um, Reed Hastings, our CEO founder, um, called The No Rules Rules. It kind of really goes into stories behind that, how this culture evolved. And it is a very unique culture. I have to say, you know, um, it, it is the main reason why a lot of people uh, want to come to Netflix and a, a lot of a lot of reason why a lot of people are still here after 10 years. Um, it's not quite as ruthless as everyone imagines, by the way. Like um, a lot of people um, have heard about the Keeper Test and and Dream Teams and kind of how, uh, you know, if, you, if you're not on the Keeper Test, you can get laid off and like, you know, uh, the, you know, turn up to work and just find out you've been laid off with a four month uh, severance package. Um, uh, that's not quite the case here. Usually people who fit into Netflix stay here for a very long time. So, and, and I haven't really seen a lot of people being kind of let go just out of the blue and stuff like that. So it's not quite as bad as that, but the culture does develop a center of excellence. And that's one of the things which I really love about this place. Um, so with that kind of side note on kind of culture, basically being a big contributor to our ability to kind of stay up and run things properly behind the scenes. Um, I'm going to focus on observability at Netflix because that's really where I work. And, and I basically, um, and my team, we develop all the core tools and platform that um, essentially collect all this data to allow us to do observability at Netflix. And everything that we use to do observability at Netflix has been built from, you know, internally. We don't, we don't use um, any third party services uh, like Datadog or those kind of things. Uh, just because of the history of Netflix, you know, we, we started all of these things years before these services existed. Um, um, but also because we just run at such an immense scale, um, there's actually a, a, a benefit to us to basically build these things internally, be able to do it at a more cost effective uh, way than we probably would from a third party vendor, but also um, be able to kind of highly customize it in terms of the experience we give our developers to the work, workflows and use cases that we need as engineers to, to, to run a reliable service for Netflix. So the three pillars that we, we kind of build and, and my team kind of owns this is metrics, logs and tracing. So um, for metrics, we um, are, are basically built on an open source. You can actually get this and actually outlier use this um, um, in our third iteration of um, our time series back end. Um, we, it's, a, it's a time series database called Atlas DB. It's, it's basically being built by, um, um, by a team, but the core developer behind that is a guy called Brian Harrington who works on our team. And basically we collect billions and billions of time series every day uh, with a two week retention and it's all in memory. So it's super, super fast. So you can imagine when there's an outage or, you know, or there's an issue, um, you know, having that kind of speed to kind of run a query on 
billions of metrics and be able to get answers back in milliseconds is very, very uh, critical uh, to kind of help you figure out what's going on. And, um, and and Atlas has supported that. And it's a highly reliable service. It's probably the pillar that everyone relies on the most at Netflix, you know, um, in order to do observability. Um, and this screenshot here is actually a, a screenshot of a tool we, we use internally called Atlas UI, which is basically like a, um, a metrics explorer. You can build queries and kind of see, you know, those, those queries and, and, and it helps you kind of dive into the metrics and, um, and build queries to kind of see what's going on. And we use um, a custom library called Spectator, which we have for various languages, uh, which is also open source, which um, basically pushes, pushes metrics from our microservices into Atlas. Um, um, so, so that's kind of embedded into the, um, into the microservices. Uh, the next pillar is logs. Um, and actually with logs, we actually combine them with error, um, uh, errors and events. So um, you can think of error monitoring as, you know, kind of show me like, you know, crash reports or this error has been reported a thousand times in the last, you know, hour or something. Um, so we basically built that together with logs into a single solution that we call Insight Logs. Um, we do about a petabyte of logs a day currently, but that's expected to go up significantly because um, we're still rolling out a bunch of services onto it. Um, but um, again, we petabyte of logs, we do it in a very highly scalable way that allows us to kind of store these logs for two weeks. Um, um, and in fact, actually it's, it's longer than two weeks for some services. So that retention period is customizable um, for each service, but two weeks is the default. But um, yeah, we store about a petabyte of logs um, across all of our services right now which um which as you can imagine you know causes a lot of scaling you know challenges and 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 costs um and we've managed to do that in a very cost effective way using some unique architecture we've developed behind the scenes which i can talk about in another talk and then finally not but not least something that i'm actually very interested in since i've joined um, netflix is tracing so we have a platform tracing platform called um nf uh, DT, uh, so Netflix Distributed Tracing, that stands for. We collect billions of traces, and that's actually billions um, after they've been sampled. So it's it's a very high number. You can imagine if we if you if you basically look at all the requests we do internally across all our different microservices, it's a very very high number. Um, so we actually sample um, quite aggressively at the moment, um, but we are looking at strategies where we can be smarter with our sampling and also maybe even do 100 percent sampling um, at some point, um, but that's all going to come back to how we build the storage behind it. Um, and we actually use Zipkin libraries in our microservices to kind of collect and um, instrument all the traces that we collect there. Um, and this is actually a screenshot of the Zipkin UI. But we actually have another tool I'll talk about in a minute, which we actually use more primarily for kind of accessing our trace data. So you can see we basically collect everything that you'd kind of expect in the observability solution, um, but at a scale that, you know, most companies can only dream of. Um, which makes it very interesting, exciting to work at. So um, in terms of uh, kind of how do people kind of access this data? Uh, so I'd say the primary tool that everyone uses is kind of dashboarding. So we have a tool that we developed called Lumen. You could think of it as our own internal Grafana. Um, you know, if you're asking why, why don't we use Grafana? Well, um, again, it comes back to the story of, well, first of all, you know, Lumen was built a long time ago before Grafana probably was um, really established. Um, this is actually V2 of Grafana that we actually just recently launched. Um, but the other side of it is, again, like, you know, what can our team do internally that you can't get from a third party tool? We can really build a customized and um, unique solution for what our engineers are trying to do internally at Netflix. Um, so, so Lumen kind of provides a lot of that. And, um, and, um, and so this is pretty much the primary dashboarding tool that most people use. And it's usually the first stop when people come into kind of figuring out what's happening with their service and, and, and uh, kind of looking at what's um, going wrong when they're trying to diagnose an issue. Um, we also have alerting. So for that, we have a tool called Radar, uh, which allows you to do some very kind of, you know, um, complex rules to to alert on metrics logs. Um, I don't think it's quite there yet, but uh, traces will be probably added at some point. But essentially, being able to take all those signals and basically set up alerts for all your microservices. Um, so our services, you know, um, can can have quite a lot of alert rules. You know, to to kind of let you let our engineers know when when things are about to go wrong before users start noticing so um so this is the tool that they do uh, that they use to basically configure all their alerts and kind of manage them and get notified 
And then last but not least, um, this is kind of audit events. So, you know, the first thing you usually do in a troubleshooting is you want to basically see what has changed since uh, uh, that may have caused this issue. So have we done a deployment recently? Did we change a fast property? So a fast property in Netflix, um, essentially all our services, we can push configuration changes out to them in real time to switch things on and off. It's a little bit like feature flagging, if you're familiar with that. Um, and so this basically keeps an audit event of all the kind of uh, deployments and fast property changes and everything that a service may um, may have had done to it. So it becomes um, kind of your source of truth to look at when there's an incident to kind of check, you know, what has changed since, you know, that may have caused this issue. Um, and so actually we have a separate tool for that called Kronos, um, which uh, may, get in, may get merged into logs and events uh, later down the line. So that's kind of like the core tooling and the core kind of signals that we collect. Um, so, because we have um, a team of around 30 now that kind of build our observability tooling at Netflix, um, of which telemetry is um, a large part of that, um, we, we basically um, have built a bunch of other tools on top of that, um, that allow us to get more out of the data that we do collect. So one of the things, as you can imagine, because we collect so much data, um, you know, we have to be quite aggressive with our kind of sampling and and um, and uh, aggregation strategies for metrics and traces and and and, and those kind of uh, data signals. So um, sometimes when you're in the middle of an incident, you may want to basically get the raw stream of all the traces and all the metrics as, as they come in and, and not have like an aggregated uh, kind of uh, summarized view of them. Um, and that's where um, Raven, this tool comes in. And so it uses uh, an open source um, tool uh, called Mantis, which you can actually download from GitHub. And Mantis, you can think of it as, you know, if we were to do stream processing on Kafka or you know, a, a service like that, which is what most companies do, it would be phenomenally expensive and pretty hard to operate as well, because Kafka does come with a high operational load as well. Um, so Mantis is actually an internal solution that we've developed in open source that essentially allows you to do stream processing for real-time data without the huge costs of kind of storing everything as logs on disks like um, a Kafka solution would. Um, and this allows us to scale very, very well. So all of our metrics, traces, and... Um, and logs get streamed into Mantis. And, and, and what Raven is, is basically a UI on top of that that allows an engineer to say, I want to get all the logs for this service, or I want to get all the traces for this service with this tag, and then maybe transform them into this metric. So if you're like looking to see like um, what device has been affected by this issue that you're trying to troubleshoot, let's say you, you, you think it's with Android devices, but you're not sure, you can get the raw stream of all those billions of uh, traces and write a Mantis uh, query and, and job, which, um, which I believe is in JavaScript, um, and, and use Raven UI to basically see that, see that data as it streams in real time. Um, and then afterwards, you can switch it off, or you can even leave it switched on to kind of um, to, to send you metrics to Atlas or whatever, so you can see like long-term trends and all that kind of stuff. So this is really kind of like the tool that everyone uses if they're in the middle of an incident to kind of do stream processing on all of those raw signals as they come in before they get aggregated and summarized. Um, the other tool that we use, so I, I mentioned that we have another tool for tracing. Um, so this tool, and we've got a blog about it if, if you're interested in reading more, um, is called Edgar. And this is kind of an example of where I talk about highly opinionated um, experiences that we can provide at Netflix that you're not going to get from a third party solution. So, you know, as a streaming company, we're very interested in streaming issues, so playback issues. So this, um, so Edgar, um, essentially what it does, it uses our tracing data um, to essentially kind of allow uh, our support users um, who are in customer support, but also our engineers to basically look up an account or a device and find all the streams and playback requests for that account or device. So if you phone up um, customer support at Netflix, the support team, what they can do with Edgar is one, they can switch on 100% sampling for your account. So for five minutes, we can basically watch every single request that you make from your device or your account um, to kind of try, try and kind of diagnose what the issue is. And then two, um, the whole design experience of the UI is basically optimized around here's all the playbacks. And then when you click on a playback, you can see every service that it interacted with. So you can see here using the trace data, we're showing a topology of all the services that were kind of 
affected or, or, or called during that playback request. And you can see in red which service probably had the issue. Um, and we also correlate it with logs and other stuff. So you can imagine when you click play, we also have to look up licenses. We have to look up your account details. So all of that data that we have to collect to kind of, you know, basically do a successful playback um, when you click the play button at Netflix, we collect that all into this very opinionated view on what data an engineer or support person needs to see to see why a playback failed. So if you ever phone up support, you're, you're, you're clicking the play button, it's not doing anything. This is actually the tool they're going to be looking at to kind of tell them which service out of the tens or hundreds of microservices you're interacting with are actually causing the issue. And then they can go to the team there and kind of tell them, well, your issue, your, your service is causing this issue for this type of device, for this user, please look in into it. And hopefully we get that resolved for you very quickly. So this is a, a very cool tool uh, that we use internally. Um, the other tool, which um, is, is really cool because, um, you know, we have a lot of control over microservices. So if there's an issue or bug in our microservices, you know, our engineers can do another deployment or they can change a fast property to kind of fix it. We can't do that as much with third party kind of open source solutions like Cassandra or, um, or, or Elastic or, or one of those kind of third party kind of database storage solutions that um, are used widely across the entire Netflix um, estate. And, um, and so, so in those, um, we, we, we actually have an um, internal remediation tool called Winston, uh, which basically allows you to run scripts remotely on any instance um, of, of uh, the Netflix um, to, to kind of do remediation automatically. So um, the reason I mentioned about the third party services is one use case, which is used a lot, is basically just to basically collect more data. So our core team, we have a core SRE team, um, when they're in an incident, they can run a bunch of Winston checks, which are pre-scripted, um, kind of like a run book to kind of, you know, fetch me data about this node. What, like, you know, maybe there's some extra data, maybe fetch me some information about this account so they can do some more kind of uh, troubleshooting and just dump in S3 and we'll go through the logs and kind of have a look at it. So this um, allows you to kind of collect more data during an incident um, using kind of, you know, pre-configured run books, essentially. But the other cool thing is for these third-party services, like we can't, update the code in Cassandra if there is an outer memory issue that keeps appearing every five hours. So instead of having to wake someone up, we will basically run a remediation script that can be triggered off one of the radar alerts that will basically go in and fix that issue you know, automatically without someone having to be woken up to fix it. And then eventually, hopefully, Cassandra comes with a fix for that and, and we, we deploy a new version. But, um, but that, this allows us to kind of put a sticky band tape on top of it until, until we have those third party updates. So that's kind of like all the tooling that we use across uh, Netflix. But I want to kind of talk about the future observability, not just at Netflix, but I think where the whole space is going and a tool we've actually developed internally, um, which I think kind of is um, our um, attempt to kind of uh, do this. So I think when you look at the kind of industry, we, we've kind of, you know, the, the problem of kind of collecting metrics, logs, traces, observability data, and then being able to visualize them, store them, there's a lot of solutions out there now. Like, you know, this is kind of a sole problem. It's become a commodity now. The, um, and you've got uh, kind of libraries like OpenTelemetry, um, which now are kind of standardizing that whole collection of metrics, logs, and traces without you having to be tied into a specific vendor. And a lot of companies are pushing that, like Microsoft, Amazon, and um, a bunch of others. Um, and, um, and, and so that kind of whole, so, so now we've kind of got to the point where we're collecting all this data. We've got some very cool tools for allowing us to dive into that data and use traces to kind of help us troubleshoot and diagnose and all that kind of stuff. Um, but really that's still a lot of data. So really the future of observability and, and one of the startups I was consulting with, uh, before um, I joined Netflix, um, was really into this is basically like AI ops to essentially use machine learning AI to essentially help users get to the root cause and understand what's happening with um, um, with with their systems um, without having to kind of trawl through thousands or millions of logs and, and traces and stuff to kind of get to that understanding. And the tool we've actually developed internally, um, which um, is still early days and we haven't rolled it out across the whole of Netflix, but it's had some very, very uh, good success so far with the services that are using it, is a there's a tool called Telltale, and um, there's a link to the blog below. You can you can Google Telltale Netflix and, and find that blog very easily. But um, you can think of Telltale as, um, you know, in today's kind of monitoring tools, you have to kind of tell it what to look for. So that's where radar and all those alert rules kind of come in. And most monitoring systems, that's where you are today. You have to tell 
the system what to look at in order for it to know when something's going wrong and alert you. And those alert rules can grow to hundreds, maybe thousands of alert rules as your kind of service gets more complex. Um, they can be quite brittle. Um, so you have to constantly kind of maintain them and tune them and all that kind of stuff. So Telltale and what a few other kind of companies are doing in, in this space is really an attempt to kind of model a service um, using machine learning. So there, so so what Telltale does, it looks at, it knows that this is a Spring Boot Java microservice and it has a bunch of kind of templates for what that service looks like and basically uses machine learning and anomaly detection to essentially watch specific kind of signals that come out of that, be it a trace or a metric or a log. And, and, and because it has a trace topology of like where that service sits in the overall architecture, it can do smart things. So for example, let's say my service goes down and, um, um, and, and it's, it's basically red. Um, Telltale can trace back through the topology and say, well, this service is also down and actually this dependent database that you're actually relying on has also gone down and actually the root cause is probably that database. So guess what we're going to do? We're not going to wake you up in the middle of the night. We're going to go and wake up the team that own that database. And so it has this kind of whole topology map of every single service that we have at Netflix and can actually get to the root cause of which service is actually causing the issue, um, actually identify what the root cause of that service is, either it's an anomalous metric or it's a, a log that we, we found in, in the log stream for that service, and then actually, you know, wake up the, the, t the, the team that needs to fix it without having to kind of wake up all the other teams that may um, have gone down as well, but, you know, aren't necessarily the root cause for that issue. So it uses a lot of machine learning to basically kind of learn what is healthy for a service, be able to determine if a service is about to, it is, is trending towards unhealthy, uh, be able to tell automatically if it is unhealthy, and then also be able to trace back and see where the root cause of that um, issue is. So we only alert the team that needs to be involved in that incident. So it's very powerful, um, still early days, but I think this is kind of where um, the, the, the whole space is going. And I wrote a blog about this for the startup I was consulting with called Zebrium, um, called the, the Future of Autonomous Monitoring, as I call it. Um, and, and really, you know, I, I can't imagine in five, 10 years time that we're all sitting there telling our monitoring systems what to look at using hundreds and thousands of alert rules. Like I think the future is going to be using machine learning and AI to do smart algorithms that can basically tell, you know, um, can, can tell what healthy looks like on a service without you having to basically put any configuration in and also help you find the root cause very, very quickly. So this is a really powerful technology that we're, we're starting to roll out across Netflix and is going to be a key part of our kind of future roadmap. So that is kind of a whirlwind tour of everything we do from an observancy point. Um, I don't know if there's time for questions. I don't know how long I went on for, but, uh, but I'm happy to take some if there are.